this list in our number 10 spot, we have the reenactment. This photo is extremely unsettling and for a very good reason. If, when you look at this photo, your instincts tell you that the guy in them is creepy, Ding, ding, ding. You're right. This is a photo that features the German serial killer Joachim Kroll. He is known for taking the lives of 14 people, all varying in age. This monster was caught in 1976, and he was discovered when police found out that he had clogged the plumbing in his apartment with remains of one of his victims. How gruesome is that? This photo was taken shortly after he was caught and arrested, and what you're seeing is Kroll reenacting one of his crimes for the police. I get goosebumps just thinking about that. I couldn't imagine being there, or being the police officer he's on top of. Talk about terrifying. I'm just glad that they caught him and got him off of the street. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense, and man does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937, and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area, which is now known as St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts that was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leaves a very eerie feeling, and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill, which is the reason for the gas masks. This photo was taken during a time when the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin, and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death, and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II, and those in this photo felt the need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. In our number 8 spot today, we have the net test. This photo comes to us from 1958, and it is quite an interesting one. At a first glance, it looks fun, but then when you catch the expression on the person's face and look a little more into it, it really just leaves you with a ton of questions as to what exactly is going on here. It looks like a guy is going on some sort of a roller coaster ride, but what is actually happening is that that a prisoner is being used to test safety nets before they were mass produced. Yeah, not the good time we thought it was. This comes from a time where capital punishment was much more widespread throughout the United States, and those waiting on death row couldn't just sit around waiting for their day to come. I think it's probably best that we made the switch to crash test dummies and that sort of thing, and this photo just remains as an eerie reminder of the less than great choices that were made in the past. In our number 7 spot today, we have a burst of joy. You might be looking at this photo wondering how this extremely joyous photo could hold any dark secrets. Well, this photo won a Pulitzer Prize, and for a good reason. This photo was captured by Slava Vetter on March 17, 1973 at the Travis Air Force Base in California. This photo shows United States Air Force Lieutenant Robert L. Sturm and his family. This was taken as he was being reunited with his family after five years of being held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. On October 27, 1967, he was leading a flight of F-105s when he was shot down over Hanoi and held captive until March 14th, 1973. I can't imagine what this must have been like for his family, because there was a huge chance that he could have not come home at all. The looks on their faces of course clearly show that this photo is capturing an exceptionally joyful moment, it's just the story behind this moment that leaves us all with that unsettling feeling. In our number 6 spot today we have Ghost Boy. This photo is said to have been taken inside of the infamous Amityville Horror House in 1976. It is said that this creepy vintage photo is still one of the most chilling paranormal photos of all time. Yep, that's right, this photo is said to be of a ghost. After the DeFeo killing, the next owner of the house, George Lutz, swore that the house was haunted and he called in none other than Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators ever. On one night of the investigations, they set up an automatic camera on the second floor of the house, and this photo is said to have been caught then. Some believe that the ghostly face staring back is that of a young John DeFoe who lost his life in this house. I'm not 100% sure either way, but what I am sure of is that if this is actually a photo of a ghost and not a real person, that is ridiculously creepy. In our number 5 spot today, we have a UFO report. This is less of a photo and is actually more like a PDF, but I still felt like it applied to today's list. This is a previously classified document from 1963. Although the document still has a ton of information that has been blacked out, the document is the description and report of an unidentified flying object or a UFO encounter. This is said to have taken place over the desert of Nevada, and the report was written in detail in order to have a written record of the event. This document is said 
said to have been the authentic report from the FBI, which is exactly why some of the details have still been omitted. This might seem like less of a big deal now, as in this day and age, we have declassified video footage of similar kinds of encounters, but for 1963, this was huge. As discussions of alien or extraterrestrial life is a big part of our modern day society, this document shows that these things have been on our minds for many, many years now. In our number four spot today, we have the Apollo 1 prayer. This photo was originally taken and meant to be a sort of lighthearted prank or joke, but it would later turn out to be a chilling image. This photo shows the Apollo 1 crew jokingly praying over a miniature model of their command module. The three men in the photo are Roger Chaffee, Virgil Grissom, and Ed White. To make this story even worse, prior to the test, the three of them had voiced concerns about the amount of flammable material that was on the craft. The fire was determined to have been caused by an electrical fault, and it spread extremely quickly due to combustible nylon material coupled with the high-pressure pure oxygen atmosphere in the cabin. They also were unable to be rescued or escape because the plug door hatch couldn't be opened against the internal pressure of the cabin. Before this test, it was believed that since there was no fuel on the rocket, it would be relatively safe, which is exactly why there wasn't more preparedness in case of emergency. Looking back now, this photo is certainly more mysterious than anyone at the time could have ever imagined. In our number three spot today, we have the Hilo Tsunami. This photo comes to us from April 1st, 1946. This is the day when an 8.6 magnitude earthquake hit just off of the coast of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. As we all know, earthquakes can often have after effects, and this one sent shockwaves throughout the Pacific. This led to the formation of an ocean-wide tsunami that had waves reaching up to 13 stories high. This disaster went on to strike Hilo, Hawaii, in what became one of the worst disasters in Hawaiian history. This photo somehow survived the disaster and it captures the terrifying view someone must have had in their last moments. This photo is especially chilling to view just days after the Tonga volcano eruption occurred. The earth and these naturally occurring disasters are absolutely terrifying and powerful and unpredictable. In our number two spot today, we have the shadows. As most of us know, on August 6th, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. This was devastating to the city, and of course we can understand the implications of this. This photo shows what is called a nuclear shadow, and this is just one that could be seen throughout the city. When the bomb detonated 1,900 feet above the center of the city, the explosion caused temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to spread through everything within 1,600 feet of it. This of course destroyed nearly everything and everyone within a mile of it. The light and heat from the bomb was so powerful that it bleached the exposed surfaces of the city, except as seen here, where an unsuspecting person was shielding the surface with their own body. It is truly such an eerie reminder of the impact that this really had. In our number one spot today, we have the crash. This is one of those photos that was just taken in the right place at the right time, but it shows a very scary situation. A man named Jim Meads is said to have taken this photo in 1962. The story goes that a man named Bob Sowray had mentioned to Jim that he was going to fly this plane, called the Lightning, the following day. Jim took his kids out for a walk that next day and took his camera with him, intending to get a shot of the aircraft as Bob flew it. He wanted to get a photo of his children with the airfield in the background just as the plane was coming into land. They found on the spot, they got all set up, just waiting for the plane to return. Turns out that day Bob didn't fly the plane, and instead the pilot was actually a man named George Aird, who was another test pilot. So George is up in the plane, and he realizes that there's trouble. Since I don't know plane language, I'm gonna use this quote from fearoflanding.com, which wrote, quote, whilst carrying out a demonstration flight, there was a fire in the aircraft's reheat zone. Unburnt fuel in the rear fuselage had been ignited by a small crack in the jet pipe and had weakened the tailplane actuator anchorage. This weakened the tailplane control system, which failed with the aircraft at 100 feet on final approach. This led to the plane pitching up aggressively as George came in to land. George lost control and he ejected in order to save himself. Luckily, since the nose had pitched up, he had just enough time. The tractor driver in this photo was then 15-year-old Mike Sutterby, who had spent that summer working on this airfield. He wasn't actually posing, he was telling Jim to move since he wasn't supposed to be there before turning to look at what was happening behind him. This is all what led to this photo being snapped and this story surviving all of these years. 
In the end, George was okay, aside from some minor injuries, and while Jim didn't get the photo he set out for that day, he still got quite an interesting one. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have a pile of bones. During the 19th century, bison were hunted so much that they were actually quite close to being extinct, and by the mid-1880s, there were only a few hundred left. Hides were prepared and then shipped off so that they could be made into leather, but usually the bones, or really anything other than the hide, was just left to decay, as it wasn't useful to the hunters. The hunting of bison was so widespread and overwhelming that even the US Army sanctioned and endorsed the slaughter of herds of bison. The federal government was promoting it for a variety of reasons, including to lessen a food and material source for the indigenous peoples. The US government was even paying a bounty for each bison skull, and military commanders were ordering troops to kill bison, not for them to eat, but just so that the indigenous couldn't. That story, coupled with the sheer mass amounts of skulls seen in this photo, is exactly what makes it so exceptionally unsettling. These bones would likely be on their way to become fertilizer. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Kahn was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental catch. In an article from the December 10th, 1933 issue of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch's Sunday magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, quote, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish. And sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. In our number 8 spot today, we have the swimsuits. This is a photo that comes to us from the 1920s, and it shows just one of the many extremely important jobs that the quote, beach patrol of the day had. Yes, they went around measuring the length between a woman's knee and the bottom of her swimsuit because God forbid she showed too much leg at the beach. In the 1920s, bathing suits began to become something that went through changes and fads, and of course this evolution to more form-fitting, less material swimwear caused a lot of controversy in the day. There were then strict dress codes implemented at places like resorts and country clubs, and even directors of public beaches had them, thus the beach patrol. There were fines for violations, and sometimes even imprisonment. In the Washington Post in 1907, there was a photo of two women in bathing suits being escorted by an officer with a caption quote, these apologies for skirts endanger the morals of the children. The police must interfere and stop the outrageous proceedings. In most cases, these sorts of rules really only affected the women of the time, and sometimes women were even required to wear stockings under their bathing suits. I'm just saying, with my attitude, I would have not done well in the 1920s. There was even one beach who had a tailor go around and stitch up swimsuits that they felt weren't up to the dress code. In our number 7 spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from a time of World War II, and it shows a terrifying ad. The sign reads, These men didn't take their atabrine. And at first, I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out atabrine is the first synthetic form of quinine which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troop fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is quite clear. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Ferris Wheel of Hate. This is a photo that, honestly, I don't even know what to say about it. It's gross, it's weird, it's upsetting, and it's honestly just so stupid. For a long time, this photo went under the radar as the photographer who took it didn't share it with the paper, but when it resurfaced 65 years later, it spread like wildfire. And for a lot different reasons than it would have back then, thankfully, but it also reveals some of those blind spots in history that we have. This photo comes from April of 1926, and it shows some members of the KKK just enjoying a day at an amusement park with many of them on a 
Ferris wheel. I wish this was one of those times where something went horribly wrong and the whole thing came crashing down, but unfortunately that likely isn't what happened on this day, and now we just have this relic that shows us the insane power and influence that this hate group had during this time. While this photo is very dark, it's an important part of history to remember. Also, before we move on, let's just take a second to talk about how stupid they all look. Like, we gotta wear our little matching outfits to the Ferris wheel. In our number five spot today, we have early plastic surgery. This photo, well, rather these two photos side by side, show a man named Walter Yo, and he was the first person to receive the, at the time, advanced plastic surgery procedure called the skin flap. Sounds disgusting. He received this procedure in 1917, and at the time, since it was so advanced, it was only used for very serious things, like for someone who was wounded in battle, which is exactly what had happened to Walter. He was a soldier in the Battle of Jutland during the First World War. Walter was actually a sailor, and he was manning the guns aboard the HMS War Spite, and while doing this, he sustained facial injuries that included the loss of his upper and lower eyelids. In the end, he needed a couple more operations, but he was even able to return to service for a little while before being medically discharged. After this, he lived his life until he reached the age of 70 years old. In our number four spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. It is commonly known that blimps, or these kinds of floating airships, use helium in them to float through the air. And it's important to note that this helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather it's one of the safest options because it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium because of a lack of it available, on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, the much more flammable hydrogen was used instead. This led to a complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight with 97 people on board. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, but it does teach us all a very valuable lesson. In our number three spot today, we have the falls. This is a photo of Annie Edison Taylor when she was 63 years old in 1901. The barrel she is posing beside is the one that she sealed herself up inside of to then become the first person to survive a trip over Niagara Falls. Why did she do this? Well, for money, of course. Annie was widowed and spent a lot of time bouncing between different jobs, but after having been burned out of her home and losing money that she had invested with a clergyman, she ended up sadly falling on some hard times, and this is what led her to the falls. The barrel she used was custom made, and it was constructed of oak and iron and padded with a mattress. It wasn't exactly easy to get this whole plan set up, and it ended up being delayed several times, mostly because people were afraid to be a part of this mission that was likely sending Annie to her death, and I truly don't blame them at all. On October 24th, 1901, her 63rd birthday, Annie climbed in the barrel with her heart-shaped pillow and was set adrift. The river currents carried the barrel over the Canadian Horseshoe Falls, and rescuers reached her barrel shortly after. She was alive and escaped with little to no injuries aside from a gash on her head. While her survival is great news, it's important to include what Annie had to say about the entire situation after, which was, quote, if it was with my dying breath, I would caution anyone against attempting the feet. I would sooner walk up to the mouth of a cannon knowing it was going to blow me to pieces than make another trip over the falls. So don't try this at home is what she's saying. In our number two spot today we have War is Hell. This is a photo of a soldier that was taken during the Vietnam War. The soldier has a hand scribed note on their helmet that reads quote, war is hell and I truly cannot even imagine. In 1954 the US entered the war to support South Vietnam against the regime in North Vietnam as well as their allies in the South. This war lasted for two decades and it claimed more than three million lives, mostly those of Vietnamese civilians. There are many, many many powerful, disturbing, and unsettling photos from this war, many of which I would consider too graphic to put here on YouTube. There is something about the brightness of the eyes of the soldier that sits in contrast with the rest of this dark photo that really make it stand out. For a while, the identity of this soldier was left a mystery, but after some years, Fran Chafin Morrison revealed that the soldier was her late husband, Larry Wayne Chaffin. Larry served for a year in the 173rd Brigade, beginning in May 1965, and when this 
this photo was taken, he was just 19 years old. He did end up being discharged from the army and was able to return home to his wife. He sadly ended up passing away at the young age of 39, thought to be because of complications due to the exposure to Agent Orange, but his legacy has lived on. There is an incredible photo of his grandson who looks strikingly similar to his grandfather, holding this exact portrait. In our number one spot today, we have the cross. This photo comes to us from 1960 and it shows Martin Luther King Jr. along with his infant son at the time removing a cross that had been burnt on his front lawn. This photo is important and powerful for quite a few reasons. Firstly, it's just a glimpse into what Mr. King would have dealt with every single day for many years. It is clear by his almost nonchalant look that this isn't something new or surprising. It's also important to note, however, that this look isn't one of acceptance or content or of someone who is unbothered, but instead it's the look of someone who continually chooses to rise above, someone who chooses to remain calm and cool in the face of adversity, the leader of a movement. As a Reddit user, 1945 best year put so well, quote, here he's a father, a man with a family whose lives are being threatened. He isn't hysterical or obviously afraid, and his towering figure literally rooting out the undesirable foe has been done in any number of war propaganda posters, but he's still sympathetic. He deserves the security of knowing that home will be safe for his children like anybody else. Starting off this countdown, we have the Judas Cradle. Whoever invented this torture device was sick. So basically, the victim would be placed into a waist harness that attached to ropes. Then the victim would slowly be lowered onto this pyramid-shaped seat. And it's got a nasty, pointy top that gets inserted up their yahoo the victim was then slowly and painfully stretched open by this device eventually their body would tear and they would be impaled doesn't that just sound peachy this instrument was used until the late 1800s in europe i can't imagine how painful that must have been so let's not bring back that form of torture Ever. In our ninth spot, we have the Mousetrap Pistol. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up. You guys already know the drill. So this was an invention that seemed like a good idea at the time. But in the end, it was found faulty for a number of reasons. So in 1882, a man named James A. Williams from Texas decided to create a trap, and I quote, by which animals which burrow in the ground can be destroyed. He then took inspiration by burglar alarms from the 19th century, which was basically a pistol rigged on a contraption that would go off when someone opened a window or door. He thought that if it worked for humans, it would work for rodents too. So basically his invention consisted of a revolver or pistol attached to basically a mouse trap. When the mouse set it off, the weapon would go off. So you see how problematic that would be? It would kill the mouse, but also take out chunks of your floor. And imagine if your foot accidentally triggered that trap. Ouch. So you can see why this invention never really took off. In our eighth spot, we have the blood powered lamp. Okay, the award for the strangest invention goes to this one. The blood powered lamp is exactly what it sounds like. It's a lamp that was powered by your blood. It was also called the Dracula bulb. It was created by a man named Mike Thompson from the Netherlands, and he designed and created it not too long ago, just in 2007. You know, a time where we have electricity. So I don't know why he thought this was a good invention, but it is kind of cool, so I'll give him that. Anyways, basically the lamp contains luminol, which is what forensic scientists use to see if there's any blood at crime scenes. Luminol reacts with the iron in blood, and as a result, it creates this bright blue glow. So this guy thought it would be a good idea to make a lamp out of luminol. Only thing is that you need to cut yourself every time that you want to use it. Basically, to use the lamp, first you mix an activating powder, then you break the ball, you cut yourself, and then you add your blood in it. As a result, the lamp will start to glow. Like I said, it's kind of cool, but also kind of really unnecessary. Coming in at number seven, we have the Pair of Anguish. This was another disgusting medieval torture device. So the pair of anguish, sometimes called the choke pair, was this pear-shaped metal device that you never want to be subjected to. So basically, this device was inserted into a victim's <clears throat> downstairs area or their mouth. Then they could turn the screw attached to this device and the pear pieces would bloom, basically expanding 
and it would stretch your openings. It was often used to get information or a confession out of someone. Basically, the device will get so uncomfortable that you'll either cave in or it'll rip your skin apart. What's sick is that they didn't want to use this device to kill someone. No, no, they wanted it to just stretch them apart slowly to cause immense pain that lasts for hours or even days. In our sixth spot, we have the Scold's Brittle. This terrifying looking mask thing is referred to as the Scold's Brittle. The first recorded use of this device was back in 1564 Scotland. Shortly after, England started using them as well. Basically, this mask was a form of public humiliation and torture. Basically, women were forced to wear this as a form of punishment for behaving immodest or rude, or if they were accused of infidelity or witchcraft. So this mask would be locked on over their head so they couldn't remove it. Then there was a spike mouthpiece attached to it so they weren't allowed to speak. They then had to walk around in public wearing it. It was meant to inflict pain on the person while simultaneously causing public humiliation. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Iron Maiden. And I'm not talking about the band here. Chances are you have heard of this disturbing invention. Basically, it was a coffin-like device that was lined with spikes. The victim was then placed in the coffin and then the executioner would close the door. The spikes were then shot directly into the victim's body. But here's the thing. They specifically positioned the spike so that the victim wouldn't die immediately. Instead, it would be a slow and painful death where they just slowly bled out. That is terrifying. Also, who is responsible for cleaning that device? Cause that would suck. Coming in at number four, we have the spike collar. So picture the Iron Maiden and now picture it around your neck. That's basically what the spike collars were. A collar with spikes all on the inside. It was then placed on a victim and the spikes would dig into their necks. What's worse than the discomfort is the fact that they wouldn't be able to lay down or sleep. They also couldn't eat or drink, so they would just suffer with this thing on for days on end. For prisoners, after the collar was placed on their neck, it was then fastened with ropes to the four walls in the room. The prisoner would stand in the middle. If they moved even an inch in one direction, the spikes would impale them so they would have to stand incredibly still. In our third spot, we have the rack. Although this invention doesn't have a scary name, don't be deceived, it is very gruesome. This was a popular torture device from medieval Europe. Basically, the victim would have their ankles and wrists tied to this device so that they were spread open. Then two executioners would crank the gears and the machine would slowly pull their limbs in the opposite directions, stretching them farther and farther apart until eventually mm, they were ripped right off. I'm telling you, people back in the day were sick. Seriously, imagine if we use this now for criminals. That would never fly. Moving on at number two, we have the dimple machine. Everyone is born with unique features. Maybe you have a butt chin, or unique birthmarks, or dimples. Now, if you don't have dimples, don't worry. There's a device that will give you some. Back in 1936, a woman named Isabella Gilbert created a device that will give people dimples. You know, if you weren't born with them and you were jealous. So basically how this works is the dimpleless person would place this contraption over their face. The device had two sets of knobs on either side of it that would poke into your skin. It was believed that if you were to wear this long enough, then it would train your cheeks to create dimples on their own. I'm sorry, no, that looks terrifying and also painful. And in our number one spot, we have the electric smile. Back in 2011 in Japan, a very weird invention was made to help children smile. It's crazy. So basically, it forces kids to smile by sending electric shocks to the kids' cheeks. This causes the face muscle to contract and voila, you gotta smile. This is wrong on so many levels, but it was targeted towards parents as a method to snap their kids out of a tantrum or to make sure they are looking perfect out in public. Here's the creepy part. The shock is so strong that the smile can last for days. And a side effect is that it can cause some twitching. Like I said before, 
This invention is just so wrong on so many levels. In our number nine spot today, we have the brazen bull. Sometimes also referred to as the Sicilian bull, this punishment method was created by the ancient Greeks. Basically, they would start by creating a sort of device that was made out of bronze and it was shaped like an actual bull. This bronze sculpture was large enough to fit a person inside, which is an important piece of information because that is exactly what they would do. Once the person was locked inside, a fire would then be set underneath the bronze bull. Of course, like we just learned with the rat trap, this of course would quickly create a very hot environment for the person who was inside. This time, it's not rats, but rather a human who would slowly be roasted to death, essentially in the bronze belly of the bull. Honestly, we're only at number 9 and I already feel sick, so let's keep going. In our number 8 spot today, we have flaying. Well, you've probably heard this word at some point or another, so do I really need to explain it? I guess that's my job, so here goes. Flaying is skinning. It's a slow and extremely painful method of removing skin from the body, usually with the attempt to keep it all intact. Yeah, I think that was probably too much information. Ew. In the early ages, this was a popular method of punishment or a means by which to get a confession, and depending on how far they went, the person may live after or not. It is said that this was a very famous method used in Mesopotamia. Sometimes instead of good old skinning, they instead would remove chunks of flesh. I'm honestly not sure which seems worse. I guess there doesn't have to be a winner, it can just all be bad. Everything on this list is terrible, it's in no particular order. How could I possibly rank these? In our number 7 spot today we have the breaking wheel. Alright folks, buckle up for this one that was once used as a method of capital punishment. This method was most commonly used in Europe from antiquity through the middle ages and into the early modern period. This was a super simple device and it really was just a wheel, but boy this one was terrible. There are two different methods with the breaking wheel, either the person would be broken on the wheel or by the wheel. So basically, excuse the gruesome descriptions, but if you were broken by the wheel, basically you'd just be placed belly down on a board and then the wheel was slammed down twice on each arm and leg and then on your spine. You'd then be tied to the wheel and hammered to a pole and the pole would be put up for the victim to be left there to die. Yeah, I know, I said it was gruesome and we still have another one to get through. Being broken on the wheel involved the limbs of the victim being tied to the wheel and then smashed with a club, and in some places the wheel would spin. Just to add a little extra terribleness, the number and the sequence in which the smashes were distributed were not random, however, as they were actually determined in court at sentencing. Alright guys, we're almost halfway, so let's keep trucking along. <laughs> in our number 6 spot today, we have death by boiling. Not to be confused with being cooked alive in the bronze bull, this is similar but very different. Possibly worse, but again, who knows? How could we possibly tell? This one is exactly what it sounds like, but it could involve either water or or oil, and that is one where I feel like I can tell which one would be worse. I'm gonna say oil. I mean, you know when you're frying something up on the stove, you either come prepared with a shield for the popping oil or it's every man for themselves. Trying to make a dumpling is now a job for only the SWAT team. This one actually wasn't a super popular method, however, and you wanna know why? Not enough blood. Okay, yeah, sorry Jigsaw, next time we'll get right on that for you. In our number 4 spot today we have Crucifixion. This one is obviously quite well known because of its religious affiliations, as this is what is said to have been done to Jesus Christ. This method of punishment involved the person being nailed to a large wooden block, or in the case of Jesus, a cross. After being nailed to this block, the person is then left out in public for people to be able to witness the slow and painful death they are about to experience. Although the story of Jesus has made this form of punishment well known in our modern society, it was actually very popular and there were many more people who were unfortunately subjected to it. Part of the reason for its popularity was because of the terror it created and the fear it instilled in people who broke the law. I mean, I'm sure there was at least one person who thought twice about committing a crime after seeing a public crucifixion. In our number 3 spot today we have sensory deprivation. We have talked about quite a few physical punishments from history today, but those are not the only kind, so let's 
let's take a second to talk about a messed up form of psychological punishment. This specific punishment is often referred to as white torture, and it is a type of sensory deprivation done to prisoners. This is when their cell, clothes, and even their food are entirely white. All of the guards wear white, all of the lights are on 24-7, and no one speaks any words. This is to take away as much sensory stimulation as possible. One of the most famous cases of this was that of Amir Fakhravar, who was subjected to this sort of thing for 8 months in 2004. After his release, even he himself stated that he was just not a normal person anymore. Surviving some of the other punishments that we've talked about today would certainly leave someone with physical scars, but this one would leave you with scars that can't be seen, and those are just as bad. In our number 2 spot today we have burning at the stake. Ah uh, yes, fire. The red flower, as they call it in the jungle book. In the early ages, people loved a good fire, and I'm not talking about the nice one we all sit around with our friends and family while we make s'mores and recant old tales. No, of course, I am instead talking about burning someone at the stake. Made famous by the multitude of witch hunts and trials of the past, burning someone at the stake was a popular form of punishment for those who were accused of treason or witchcraft. It was popular for reasons similar to crucifixion because burning someone at the stake was both a spectacle for the dark souls who would want to watch something like that, but it was also a warning to all those out there. In our number one spot today we have sawing. Okay, this one pretty much always ended in death, so buckle up. This method was used in different portions of the world, but was mostly seen in Rome, Spain, and some portions of Asia. This is another straightforward one, unfortunately. This would be done to a criminal who had been given the sentence of capital punishment, and it basically just involves them getting sawed in half. That's it! I'm not exactly sure what else to say to be completely honest. It is said that sometimes the sawing was transversely, and sometimes it was lengthwise, and to that I say, does it even matter? There's a weirdly detailed history about this one, so I think we can all just take a moment of gratitude that these don't exist anymore, and that we don't do this. Because it sounds absolutely terrible. Alright guys, that has been our list for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for checking it out. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video today. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more. I swear it isn't always this terrible and gruesome. Sometimes we actually have a nice time, alright? <laughs> Number 10! The Black Plague. Speaks for itself, really. I mean, I, I would still take COVID over this any day, but like, huh. The Black Plague was a wave of death and disease that struck fear into any who encountered it. Not only was the time period incredibly ill-equipped to handle it, a miracle we survived, what with basically no knowledge of hygiene whatsoever, it was a painful ordeal. Blood and pus filled boils would emerge, followed by fever, chills, vomiting, violent number twos, and aches and pains, which would inevitably end up in death. People who were perfectly healthy when they went to bed might have ended up dead the next morning. It was that fast. People did everything they could to avoid the sick. Doctors refused to see patients if they did. Their procedures were dangerous and unsanitary. I think what scares me the most about this is the lack of understanding around the disease or disease in general. No one had any idea what was causing it and if you thought isolation was bad, imagine doing that without telephones, iPads, social media, or Skype. You would have no idea what was going on with your family. Family. So, um, yeah, definitely the Black Plague. It's up there. Number nine, the King James Witch Hunts. Of course, we have to add some more witch hunts to this list because there were many. And this time they weren't hanged, they were burned at the stake. Not fun. And this by mere scale was much worse than the Salem Witch Trials. For some reason, King James I of England had something against women. Oh, whoa, sorry, I meant witches. 85% of the people accused were women. King James believed that he and his Danish bride had been specifically targeted by witches after encountering a dangerous storm while trying to cross the North Sea, which by the way, is notoriously bad to cross anyways. He believed the storm was conjured and the first he accused was Galus Duncan. Her employer, David Seaton, forced a confession out of her through torment, after which she named several accomplices. Duncan retracted her confession, but it was too late. The witch trials began, and in 1591, Agnes Samson confessed that 200 witches sailed to the church of North Berwick on Halloween night in 1590. There, the devil preached to them, and they began to plot the king's destruction. The convicted witches were burned at the stake, a much more terrifying way to die than by hanging, even though that's still bad, and over 100 were implicated, with many being executed. Because how you disprove something that's not real. Number eight, zombies. A real life zombie apocalypse, anyone? For me, no thank you. 
too. I'm not nearly as scared of witches as I probably should be, but I definitely don't want to be anywhere near a zombie movie. Unless Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are involved because I love them. I would sell my soul for that. While many of us like to romanticize the Renaissance, it actually had a mini zombie infestation, specifically in Italy. And a major outbreak of syphilis broke out in 1494, which is probably one of the most horrific STDs known to mankind. If untreated, it can literally eat your face off. In the mid 15th to 16th century, Italy was a field of war, which most likely led to the infection with all the comings and goings of travelers and the affairs. They had awful ways of treating it, many of which involved the use of hot pokers in places I can't nor want to mention. I'm not sure what terrifies me more, the disease or the medical care used to treat it. It affected most of the nobility, especially those in the military who would often seek out extramarital affairs. The son of Pope Alexander VI is one famous example. Cesare Borgia had to wear a leather mask to hide the disfigurement from the disease. But if you couldn't hide behind the wealth, then you were left wandering the streets in a terrifying half melted feverish state. Number seven, Pompeii. A massive world ending explosion? Suffocating thousands and covering their corpses with lava sound great to anyone? No, me neither. The fact that people still live in and around Pompeii astounds me. You know what could happen again, right? Right around lunchtime on August 24th, 79 CE, a huge earth shattering eruption blasted volcanic debris all over the city of Pompeii. Over the next few days, clouds of blistering hot gases swarmed the city, buildings were destroyed, the population was either crushed or suffocated. The city was literally covered in ash and stone for centuries until it was finally unearthed in the 1700s. I visited the city and the stone corpses frozen in whatever position they were in when they died is haunting to say the least. Absolutely terrifying. Mount Vesuvius, the volcano mentioned, sits above at 154 mile deep pit of magma and scientists think it's overdue for an eruption. So yes, I would take the Salem Witch Trials over that any day. Number six, Jack the Ripper. An unknown killer preying on London committing horrendous and brutal acts? Yeah, no thanks. I don't even like doing lists about the serial individuals we have mentioned. I would take a witch over Ted Bundy or Ed Gein any day. Because there's nothing in question there. They are real. Witches? Don't know. But Jack the Ripper remains one of the most terrifying serial killings of history and remains unsolved. In the East End of London in 1888, five gruesome murders took place in Whitechapel. Not only were their lives taken, but their corpses were mutilated in nightmarish ways. The crimes had a huge impact on society as a whole up until that point. Crimes such as that had never been so heavily in the press. The name Jack the Ripper became coined after a haunting letter sent to the London news agency was signed by Jack. This was just one of the letters he sent, one being accompanied by a kidney preserved in wine. Number five, Holodomor. The Holodomor was the first genocide that was meticulously planned out in order to cause the most suffering. The withholding of food was used as a weapon. Between 1932 to 1933, millions, millions of Ukrainians were killed by a man-made famine engineered by Joseph Stalin. Rural farmers made up of 80% of Ukraine's population and they were the primary ones hit. After World War I and the fall of the Russian monarchy, Ukraine established the independent Ukrainian People's Republic in January 1918. They fought the Bolshevik army for three years but eventually fell and was forced to be a part of the Soviet Union. Stalin's vendetta against Ukrainian farmers began when their unrest resulted in a new economic policy that gave them more freedom. Stalin didn't like that. When Stalin at last established his stronghold, he decided to destroy Ukrainian peasantry. Through widespread intimidation arrests, imprisonments, he took out church leaders, Ukrainian intellects, party functionaries, and basically anyone who opposed him. Then in August 1932, he decreed that if anyone, even a child, was caught taking produce from a collective field, they could be shot or imprisoned. He sealed the borders so no one could leave, and they were all forced to starve to death. And finally, it ended in 1933 when Stalin said, essentially got what he wanted. Number four, the Spanish Inquisition. Ah yes, the classic Monty Python joke. But if it is a joke, then why is it on here? Well, good friends, that's because it was terrifying. And we are talking about witch trials, and this is kind of like that. Nobody knows exactly how many people died during this time, but it's estimated to be anywhere from 30,000 to 300,000. 
big jump. Basically, it was a purge of non-believers by the Vatican, especially those in the Jewish community. Tomas de Torquemada was one such evil man during the event who played the role as Grand Inquisitor for a time. If you weren't Catholic, you were given two choices. One, convert, or two, be burned at the stake for heresy. There was really no in-between. He, along with many others, used cruel measures of torments and even worse. Do you want to know how long this lasted? Yes. Nope, not 10 years, not 15, 350 years. Number three, residential schools. Yeah. This one's rough. You may have heard a lot about residential schools recently as over a thousand bodies and unmarked graves have been found across Canada and there's bound to be more. Residential schools were government and church sponsored religious schools designed to assimilate indigenous children to a Euro-Canadian culture. They tore children away from their families and over 150,000 First Nation, Inuit and Meti children attended the schools. More than 38,000 indigenous people experienced horrendous abuse of both a physical and depraved nature at the hands of residential school teachers and priests. Former students have testified that people died from disease, accidents, fires during attempts to escape or killed to cover up nefarious affairs. When family members died, mothers and fathers were never even told where they were buried. The residential school period of Canadian history is terrifying and for a while wasn't really talked about. I didn't learn about them until I came to university and then recalled a story I was told of how nuns used to make molasses candies and put them on school desks to encourage indigenous children. I wasn't told about anything else. The reality wasn't nearly as pretty. The last school closed as recently as 1996 and so far 1,300 suspected unmarked graves have been found through radar technology with dozens more schools to be left searched. Number two, Khmer Rouge. Orchestrated by Cambodian leader Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge was one of the most horrific points in history. Much worse than the Salem Witch Trials. It's like, that's nothing compared to this. During 1975 to 79, the totalitarian leader caused the death of over 2 million people through forced labor, starvation, disease, torment, persecution, and blatant execution. Pot and his radical communist society was trying to purify society in order to make capitalism and other Western ideologies disappear. I can't even begin to imagine how terrifying this would be to live through. This is the real 1984. He cut off all media outlets along with communication with embassies, education was stopped, healthcare was eliminated, he basically locked Cambodia off from the rest of the world. He knew that anyone with intellect would threaten his regime, so he eliminated anyone who symbolized that, even people who wore glasses. There was the police, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ex-soldiers along with their families. He took all of them out. He forced everyone into what became known as the killing fields and forced them to work off of only 180 grams of rice a day. It took years for his peers to finally have enough of him and lock Pot away under house arrest, but even then he was never really truly punished. Khmer Rouge was finally overthrown by invading Vietnamese troops in 1979, but it was only until the 1990s to the early 2000s after Pot died that prosecutions began. Number one, World War II. The whole thing. All of it. Outside and inside this war, it was a horrendous time. Like I probably don't even need like to go too far into this. I mean, if you look at all the lists I've ever done about evil people, a lot of them come from World War II specifically. From rations to constant threats of bombings to of course the hundreds of war crimes. This war was the depiction of good and evil facing off. The Holocaust is probably one of the cruelest points of history where over 6 million people were killed just for their religious beliefs or point blank immutable qualities. There was no shortage of horrors before, during, and even right after. Not only were lives of millions upon millions taken, but many were tormented or experimented on in vicious and cruel ways. Even though it ended in victory for the Allies, the two nuclear bombs that hit Hiroshima and Nagasaki announced to the world what would happen if we had a World War III. Alan Turing, the man who basically is the reason the Allies won, was punished for who he chose to love. So it was just like, an insane time, and I can't even imagine living through it. Kicking off the list at number 10, blindfolded gladiators. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn has to blindfold himself and then he still somehow wins? What a moment in time, no dry eyes in the theater at all. Amazing. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull the same trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return to these massive events back in the day, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. They would have cheap beer nights at the Coliseum, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada. And that's when gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. 
How insane does that sound? Are you kidding me? I'd go and watch, probably. I don't know. They would also leave the armor inside. They would mostly battle in just sandals and cloth. Yeah, and you thought Marco Polo made you anxious? Try again. They would save these events for criminals, I guess, but like... Come on, stealing bread and then fighting a tiger? The Coliseum was a little unfair, gotta admit. Number nine, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane, I had to throw it in here. Elmer McCurdy, back in 1911, so a bit more recent than the Coliseum days, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal, and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather it was full of passengers. So he collected a whopping $46 instead. Instead of a gold heist, he got $46, which back in the day was still, that was still not bad, I'm not gonna lie. Things were going fine until he was shot by a lawman. Now this is when things start to get really insane. Elmer's body was embalmed and then sold by the undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost. And for the next 60 years, his body was passed around as a prop. It was sold between haunted houses, wax museums, that kind of stuff. Check out this guy who tried to do this and blah, blah, blah. Such as I'm doing now, but I would have his body here. I don't know, people are weird. Eventually the guy's body, like his real body, don't forget, ended up in California at an amusement park fun house at Long Beach. Come 1976, there's a crew there filming the movie The Six Million Dollar Man, and that's when Elmer's finger broke off, revealing that it was an actual mummy and not a prop on the set. They went to film The Six Million Dollar Man and ended up finding The Forty Six Dollar Man in real life. That is so gross. Imagine that. Some guy with a boom mic's like, um... Number eight. Fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of seeing, you know, things that they love get blown to smithereens, more than fair. So they figured, let's try and fool the Germans flying overhead. Let's just build a fake Paris. Yeah, a fake Paris. Let's psych them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. This life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. And it worked. This tiny town called Mason's Lafitte, now of course it's looking a lot more full. Now it's like a rich town, not fake buildings, but actual real buildings where rich people live. That's fun. There were three different zones set up just in case anything were to drop around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, and mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake guard Nord train station. That was the whole pull over there. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafitte, the main fake Paris city I just talked about. And zone C was the industrial area. So basically it was just east of the city and they had a massive factory built with literally nothing inside of it. Just a big shell. This sounds a lot like Home Alone, just on a larger scale when you think about it. But with these missions only happening overnight back then, creating a light show with some big props wasn't a bad idea. Lights were carefully spaced out on the ground so it looked like a breathing city from above. Check it out. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. How amazing is that? Number seven, Mad Jack. During World War II, you needed all the power you could get, but one man, one man won, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, AKA Mad Jack, great nickname, he had a different mindset when it came to battle and weaponry. He believed that any British soldier going into battle without a sword was improperly dressed. Also, fun fact about Mad Jack here, he represented Great Britain in the World Archery Championships. So not only did he have a sword, but he also went into battle with a longbow. Yeah, like an Avenger. History has acknowledged Mad Jack as the last man to officially taken out an enemy in combat by using a longbow, which is pretty cool. But here's the most intimidating part about him. Before combat, Mad Jack would play the bagpipes right before drawing his sword and then running at you in battle. Can you imagine? That's some Game of Thrones stuff. A dude ripping the bagpipes, dropping it, and then sprinting at you full on with a sword and a longbow. Good game. I would just fold. I'd throw my on the ground. I'd be like, nope, you win. Take it. Take off the land. Number six, Ball the Burning Men. If you're gonna party like it's 1999, at least do so safely, you know? Back in 1393 in Paris, these knights would put on these fun party performances for the king. They would dress up and pretend that they were wild beasts. They would soak their armor with shrubbery and dry grass and hay, they would stuff it, anything to make them look like, I don't know, a hairy beast almost? Which first of all, great bit, pretty itchy. Honestly, great commitment. The party was going well and they planned for these wacky performances, so they had to ban candles and torches from this room. The king's brother, he was drunk, maybe he was, you know, at a festival of drunkenness prior, I don't know. He walked in with a torch and all hell broke loose. He got too close to one of these knights, one of these stuffed knights, and, well, he caught on fire and, yeah, you could probably figure out the rest. It was 
bad news. Number five, coffee ban. This is the worst of the worst right here, halfway, let's do it. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. This guy banned coffee. Yeah, what an absolute monster. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because, you know, he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he put forth these laws just because he could, and he made these laws punishable by death, so he wasn't playing around. Yeah, this guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a party pooper. He would take this so seriously as well, he would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around the streets aimlessly in hopes that he would catch one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you weren't charged or anything like that, but rather, Murad IV himself would just take off your head right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. How horrible is that? No coffee, could you imagine getting your head because you had a coffee? Get out of here. Number four, royal curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. A storm had flooded a cathedral in Vilnius and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area. God forbid it flooded, obviously. But on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. No one has found them at any point before. These remains were still buried with the crown. It was like a whole scene untouched. It was from the 15th century. What a fine. Mind, right? Sadly, the flood ended up ruining all of these remains, and this is when things start to get a little mysterious. All those involved in these findings began to die in unusual circumstances afterwards. One professor had died after falling down a lift shaft in his apartment. Another guy died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues, but apparently it was sketchy or not supposed to happen. Another professor, years later, who worked in the crypt as well, became paralyzed randomly at 62. A sculptor, also involved, died when untying his shoelace, so a freak accident. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt again. I hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were legitimately trying to preserve history and avoid the crypt flooding. We need a Ouija board to clear this whole situation up. We need one guy to be like, hey, by the way, just explain everything. Number three, the festival of drunkenness. Wait, is this an actual thing? Hold on. Nowadays, we have parties for just about everything. There's a baby on the way, let's party. Baby just came out, let's party. Baby turned one, now we got a party at like 11 a.m. We just love celebrating. We'll find excuses to celebrate. Well, the festival of drunkenness in Egypt back in the 15th century just, well, they got right to the point. Just drink your faces off. That's it. This religious event, and yeah, you heard me, religious event, was to celebrate the Egyptian sun god, Ra. And the story goes as such. Ra stopped the end of the world way back in the day when Hathor was planning on devouring all of life. So Ra successfully thwarted their plan by getting them drunk off 7,000 jars of beer. That's a lot of IPAs, oh my. The beer was dyed red to look like blood. Hashtag pranked ya. So now the god was so drunk that it couldn't, you know, devour everybody. So ancient Egyptians would honor this again, religious event, by getting absolutely plastered. If you didn't pass out, that was considered offensive, like not burping after a meal. Also, drink responsibly. Number two, Caesar and Caligula. Running the clock back to 12 CE, Gaius Caesar, AKA Caligula, AKA the Roman emperor at the time, apparently he was close with his horse. I had two dogs growing up, I would ride or die for those little piggies, okay? I get it, I'm an animal lover myself. And if I had the money, yeah, I would probably make them a house, just for them just to run around with and all that jazz. Well, he gave his horse a marble stall and it got to the point where they were so close, Caligula was about to appoint the horse to high office of council, but he was taken out. Imagine if he had lived and this happened, what would those meetings look like? What would they smell like, rather? I don't want to know. Let's move on. And finally, coming in number one, Adrian Carton de Wyatt. Over the course of six decades and four wars, Lieutenant General Adrian Carton de Wyatt survived the impossible multiple, multiple times. He's considered one of the most dedicated soldiers of all time because, well, for starters, after he lost his left hand and his left eye, Adrian did not retire. In fact, the British Army officer went on to experience 10 more horrible injuries. As World War I broke out in November 1914, Carton was serving and he was opposing the forces of the Dervish state. In doing so, he was shot in the arm and face, that's how he lost his left eye, but a grim detail shared by Lord Ismay, who served alongside the soldier, said in 1964 that the doctor at the time couldn't do anything, not a single thing, about his eye. So he must have been in pure agony the entire time. Literally, he must have been just the, the worst pain. Lord Ismay continues to believe that losing his eye was actually a blessing in disguise because the incident allowed for Adrian to relocate to Europe where even more action was waiting for him. Once stationed in Europe, Adrian received wounds to the head, hand, stomach, groin, leg, 
ankle all by bullets, all a bad time. And if that's not inspiring enough, he survived numerous plane crashes and a broken back afterwards. If you feel like reading more incredible details about the soldier and the diplomat, there's a book on his whole life. And yeah, it's more interesting than I just made it sound. Starting us off at number 10, we have Giovanni Aldini. Aldini is one of the many scientists who is actually the inspiration for the infamous Mary Shelley novel, Frankenstein. Aldini was a 19th century physicist obsessed with the effects of electrocution. <laughs> Who isn't? Am I right? Anyway, he was a bit of a celebrity and he was known to travel throughout Europe demonstrating the powers of electricity. What makes this guy evil though? Well, he was one of the first scientists to use electrical shocks on mental patients. He also enjoyed electrocuting corpses. One of his most famous acts involved him displaying a body of a hanged criminal and then shocking the body to then make the muscles contract and spasm as if the deceased was still alive. I get it. Electricity is cool, but how about a little respect for the dead? Hmm? Aldini was also highly respected at the time. The Emperor of Austria even made him a Knight of the Iron Crown. Ooh, sounds evil, doesn't it? At number 9 we have Wang Hu Suk. Wang is famously known for his work creating human stem cell lines using cloned embryos from patients suffering from spinal cord injury. This major accomplishment promised an endless supply of stem cells genetically matched to patients but it turned out to be all lies. Wang admitted in 2006 that he was indeed falsifying data but still claiming that he had the ability to do what he was lying about all along. The court found Huang guilty of buying human eggs in violation of the country's bioethics laws and embezzling 830 million won, which is equivalent to 700,000 US dollars of government money. He was sentenced to two years in a Korean prison. He received such a light sentence because the judge admired Huang's dedication to Korean biotechnology. Many other Korean scientists in the community are not ready to welcome him back though, after embezzling so much money on what is supposed to be a great and worthy cause. One Korean researcher states that it is truly tragic because he is clearly one talented experimentalist. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Pretty hard to just trust someone with government and public money after a stunt like that, but hey, I hope there's some scientific breakthrough soon. At number 8 we have Jose Delgado. Back in the 1960s at Yale University, Professor Jose Delgado was working on some pretty scary stuff. Delgado invented one of the first ever brain chips. He was known to use these chips in bulls, monkeys and <gasps> humans. It is reported that he once stopped a charging bull in its tracks after pressing a button that activated the small chip inside the animal's head. With the touch of a button, these radio waves could make these animals snarl, growl, smile, invoke lust, hunger and many more responses. Delgado recently described himself as a libertarian and pacifist whose goal as a scientist was to liberate us from our biology and especially mental illnesses and aggression. I don't know about that. It sounds a lot more to me like he was trying to take over the world with some pretty crazy mind control chips, but he was also known to test on mental patients. Whether this one is with good intentions or not, this one freaks the hell out of me. At number 7 we have Albert Bandura. Bandura is a famous psychologist who interestingly enough just passed away days ago in California. He is famous for being one of the first scientists to discover that learning occurs both through beliefs and through social modeling, which then led to the social cognitive theory. One of his most famous experiments he ever conducted was back in 1961 and was titled the Bobo Doll Experiment. In this experiment, Bandura hired researchers to physically and verbally abuse a clown faced inflatable toy in front of many preschool aged children. Which when the adult researchers left and the children were left alone with the already beat up doll, the children took on the attitudes of the adults and began yelling and beating up the doll as well. This was later to prove the theory that children were indeed influenced by the violence in media and helped prove his later social cognitive theory. The theory that a person's environment, cognition and behavior all interact to determine how that person functions as opposed to one of those factors playing a dominant role. Teaching kids to be future bullies in the schoolyard? <laughs> pure monkey see evil, pure monkey do evil. At number 6 we have Craney Landis. Landis was a graduate student at Minnesota University back in 1924. He asked his other graduate students to assist him in conducting an experiment in understanding if we humans all react similarly in different emotions. So he painted specific lines on each individual's face and then got them to react to certain stimuli. At first the experiment was harmless. He would record each of their faces as they listened to music, smell ammonia, read passages from the bible, tell a lie, little things like that. But seeing no real results, he decided to up the ante. He then showed them pornographic images, then some horrendous photos of skin conditions, firing random gunshots to frighten his test subjects, getting them to stick their hand in a pail of slimy live frogs that had a live wire in the bottom so when they touched the live wire they would get an electric shock. Finally the worst 
one of them all? Decapitating a rat. He finally put a live rat in one hand and a knife in the other hand and the test subject was then demanded to cut off the animal's head. If they refused, then he would do it in front of them. Sounds pretty scarring, if I do say so myself. Some started crying, others laughed in disbelief, and others got angry and swore at him. Two thirds ended up carrying out the dark death sentence, and the worst part of it all was that Landis even used a 13 year old boy, who was actually a patient at the university. His findings in the end proved nothing and were quite different patient to patient. In the end, he just seemed like an evil madman scientist. Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have Johann Conrad Dippel. This scientist was born in Castle Frankenstein back in 1673, so it is only fitting that he was a mad and evil scientist. Dippel was a theologian, alchemist, and scientist who developed a popular dye called Prussian Blue, and it's actually still used to this very day, which is very cool, but he is also known for the most most controversial of things, such as mixing animal bones and hides together in a stew he named Dipple's Oil. Real original. He claimed that whoever drank this gross oil would then have an extended life, but he never said how long either, so I mean, whatever, dude. He loved dissecting animal bodies, and many believed he frequently dug up and stole human bodies and conducted weird experiments on them in his laboratory. Needless to say, this guy is one of the main inspirations for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But to the best of our knowledge, he never had the same luck as Dr. Frankenstein in the book. I'm guessing he tried to give that magical animal elixir to the corpses to see if he could bring them back to life, but sorry pal, no liquid on earth can do that. And oh, by the way, Miss Johnson would like her husband back, <laughs> and her cat. At number four we have Duncan McDougall. McDougall was born in 1866 in Glasgow, Scotland and later moved to Haverhill, Massachusetts. One of his most famous experiments he conducted was the 21 grams experiment where he placed a dying patient on a cot that was on a scale and weighed the patient before and after the moment of death. His findings? That immediately after death, the deceased weighed 21 grams less, meaning that the soul was indeed a physical part to a human's body and that it did indeed leave once a person passed away. The work was absolutely destroyed in the scientific community, but defended in the religious community as they deemed this was proof of a soul in a person's body. But what makes this guy evil? Well, he conducted the exact same experiment with dogs and noticed no weight change at all. He then made the statement that dogs don't have souls. Dogs don't have souls? You don't have a soul, you jerk! Ah, uh, you say one more wrong thing about me, Mutt, and I'll shove your pipes right up your kilt! Starting us off in our top three, at number three, we have Louis Julian West. For anyone out there that loves animals just as much as they love their fellow humans, this one is a scary one for you. West was quite the controversial scientist and researcher with ties to the top secret CIA project called Project MK Ultra. It was a project that used many US citizens, some of them even unwittingly, to use LSD and other drugs to see if these substances would have any mind control effects. West's studies are also believed to have major repercussions, such as a murder of a young victim, as well as the death of a full grown elephant. The reason he felt the need to experiment on elephants though? West knew that male elephants experienced fits, so he believed that he could induce an elephant rage with LSD. He gave the giant creature enough LSD to dose 3,000 people, and tragically, the elephant died. It was then that West concluded that elephants were sensitive to LSD. <laughs> yeah, do you think? For many reasons, this guy seems like an evil scientist. From human and animal's deaths related to the overdose of LSD, I think it's safe to say that we don't want to get anywhere near this guy. At number two, we have Sidney Gottlieb. Sidney Gottlieb was the one who headed Project MKUltra and worked closely with West in our number three spot. Gottlieb was tasked with testing LSD in interrogation settings, but he didn't just test his work in interrogation settings or even in a lab. He actually brought his studies to the bar, where he would slip LSD into unsuspecting bar patrons' drinks. I don't think we need to question how unethical or wrong this one is, as it is clearly something that is messed up and sometimes still happens today, unfortunately. But this video is titled Evil Scientists in History Who Went Mad, and I think this is a pretty good proof that this guy was off his freaking rocker. And finally, coming in at our number one spot is most definitely the most evil scientist of them all. This is Josef Mengele. 
Joseph was one of the most famous scientists at the most horrific concentration camp of World War II. A member of the Third Reich, Joseph was a camp doctor. He was known to be one of the doctors to select the poor people who were to be sent to the gas chambers and even went as far as volunteering for more and more shifts when he could. He also conducted many tortuous and inhumane experiments on prisoners of all ages. After the war, Joseph escaped to Argentina and was never captured by the authorities. He did, however, drown in 1979 in Brazil. While many on this list were half-jokingly evil and gone mad, I think anyone who takes pleasure in sending large numbers of people to their doom is most definitely evil and I think mad just goes hand in hand with this one. Mm -hmm.